going. All right. So first of all, I want to welcome everyone uh, to tonight's presentation. <clears throat> Before we even begin, I just want to take a moment to acknowledge you and really for you all to take a moment to acknowledge yourselves. I know how hard it is to find time to get away, to kind of carve time out uh, to do things like this. And I know that estate planning and thinking about creating a plan for when you're not there is not the most lively, exciting thing to do. And so people have a tendency to put it off. So first of all, uh, just good for you for showing up for yourselves and, and for your family tonight. In exchange, I wanna share with you um, all of the things that I've learned as an estate planner about how to protect families with young kids and how to protect families with older kids. Um, I started this when my kids were still young, my kids are adults now, and I've watched my own plan change over the years from when they were daycare age through preteen, through high school, and now uh, my youngest is three quarters of the way through her college career and my oldest is uh, out of college and living and working in Boston. So I wanna share all of that with you tonight. So I'm David Feeks. I am the owner and founder of the Parents Estate Planning Law Firm in Acton. Our firm is solely focused on estate planning um, for both families with minor children and for empty nesters. So as we say, for parents in, at all ages and in all stages of parenting. And you know, as I said, the way that we built the firm was designed to help families be sure that no matter what happens, that there is a plan in place to take care of their kids and their families. And what I've discovered over the years is that most parents know they need to do something. Everybody knows they need to do something, but nobody's exactly sure what it is that they need to do. And even if they have some big concept of what they need to do, most parents don't know where or how to get started. So that's what I, what I wanna share with you tonight. What do you need to do and how do you get started on all of this? So, you know, for those of you with minor children, as I said, I've been where you are. Uh, for those of you with older children, and I've seen some of the ages in the chat, so I can tell you even where your older kids are heading in the next few years. Um, you know, as I said, I watched my kids grow up and I made sure that our plan kept pace with all of the changes that were going on in our lives. As our kids got older, as our finances changed, as forces from outside of our family that had an impact on our plan, which forced it to change uh, over the years. So again, that's what I wanna share with you. So stick with me all the way through to the end. Um, I got a lot of great, great things to let you in on, uh, some secrets to let you in on. And at the end, I'm gonna share with you steps that you can take to make sure that you can get this in place for your family. So a little housekeeping before we dig in. Number one, we're gonna be together for about the next 45 minutes. We're gonna leave time at the end for questions. So as we go through, if you have questions, you can drop them into the chat. So you don't have to save them up until the very end. I don't want you to forget a question that occurs to you when it occurs to you. So just feel free to drop that into the chat. Here's what I'd like you to do. Put the capital letter Q in front of your question. That way, when we go back through at the end, it's easy for me to figure out what's a question versus what's just a comment in the chat. So drop a capital Q in front of it, then I can go back in and grab those questions. And again, I'll hang around as long as there are questions that you have. Last thing before we dig in, tonight is educational. So I'm not providing you legal advice. Your being on this webinar is not creating between us an attorney-client relationship, uh, purely educational. And any references I make to the law tonight are going to be references to Massachusetts law Massachusetts is where our office is located and where the attorneys in our office are admitted to practice. So as I said, my goal for you tonight is to walk away with a better idea of what it takes to create a rock solid plan for your family and how you can get started 
on that planning right now. So let's dig in. I wanna talk about tonight four elements. There are four elements of a rock solid estate plan. There is a plan for your kids. And this is uh, particularly for those of you who have minor children. So you need a plan for your kids. Once your kids are all 18, you don't need a plan for your kids anymore. You need a plan for your money. You need a plan for your incapacity. You need a plan for your legacy, but you don't need a plan for your kids. But for those of you who have kids under the age of 18, you do need a plan for your kids because they will need a legal guardian until they turn 18 and they become legal adults in their own right. So we'll talk about a plan for your kids. We'll talk about a plan for your money and your assets. What happens to your money? What's the potential impact of estate taxes on what would be left over for your kids? So we'll talk about that. Number three, we'll talk about a plan for incapacity. Not what happens if you die, but what happens if you don't die? What happens if you're incapacitated and you need someone to step in and make healthcare or legal or financial decisions for you when you can't make those decisions for yourself? And then finally, I wanna talk about a plan for legacy which is a little bit unusual. This is not something that most estate planning attorneys are talking about, but it's something that is really important in our firm. It's something that we work uh, with all of our clients uh, on now. And I think it's a really, really important piece. And when we get to that, I think you'll really understand why it's such an important piece. So those four, plan for your kids, plan for your money and your assets, plan for incapacity, plan for your legacy. Okay, let's dig in. Plan for your kids. So for those of you with minor children, you need to name guardians for them. Most of you know you need to name guardians for your kids. I'm pretty convinced, having been a parent for 24 and a half years, that there is some kind of early warning system <clears throat> that goes off in every parent that basically starts to nag at you from the moment your first child is born. Sometimes it nags at you from before your child is born. Maybe from the, <clears throat> if you're a mom, from the moment you become pregnant and know you're going to have uh, a family. And that warning system sounds something like this. You are now responsible for this life form that cannot take care of him or herself. And you need to have a plan for what happens if you're not here to take care of this child that you have brought into the world. That's now, the warning doesn't say it in those words. <clears throat> just Sometimes it's just a persistent sense of anxiety. Sometimes it's waking up in a sweat at three o'clock in the morning in a panic about what happens if I were to die or if we were to die if you're married. <clears throat> so you know you need to do something. As I said before, most parents don't know exactly what that looks like or how to get started. Here's what it looks like. You need to name guardians. These are the people you want to step in and care for and love and raise your kids as close to the way that you would if you would if you were still there. And it doesn't matter who these people are. These are the people just that you know and trust to raise your kids the way you want them to be raised. <clears throat> Here's the problem. If you don't have a plan, you, someone else is making the plan for you. And the person who's making that plan for you doesn't know you can't ask you questions because you're gone, doesn't know who you would choose out of anybody available, doesn't know who you would never choose. Because let's face it, <clears throat> and I've discovered this in my practice, about 40% of the clients that I talk to have somebody in their family, parents, siblings, that they know they don't want to be the guardians of their kids who they're afraid might challenge the decisions that they've made. So. The person who's planning this for you, if you don't plan for yourself, doesn't know that. And the person who's making this plan for you is a probate court judge. <clears throat> if you live in Middlesex County, the probate court is the Middlesex Probate Court. It's located in Woburn along 128 where the courthouses have now relocated, uh, used to be in Cambridge. And, and again, that judge is working off very limited information. So the only way that a judge can know who it is that you really, really want to take care of your kids and raise your kids is to leave them a roadmap. This is who we want. This is why we want these people. 
Um, but otherwise, a judge is just doing their best, but they're working off very limited information. And when you're thinking about guardianship, you want to be thinking in two distinct time frames. So when I was just talking about guardianship, those of you with young kids, you probably automatically went to the long-term time frame. If I die, if we die, who do we want to step in and raise our kids until they're all 18? There's another time frame you need to know about and another time frame you need to plan for. And I want to start there because most of you have not given this any thought at all. And sadly, the reason you haven't given any thought isn't because you're an uncaring parent. It's because no one's helped you to think about it. And this thought does not come up naturally, what we call organically in tech. Um, and that's the short-term time frame. And it goes something like this. Even if you've named long-term guardians, if your long-term guardians do not live very close to where you live, think of 15 or 20 minute travel radius around your house. If your long-term guardians live an hour away, two hours away, six hours away, I've got lots of clients whose guardians live outside the United States or otherwise are on the West Coast and are at least a plane ride away. Now think about a Saturday night when you and your spouse may have gone out to dinner and a movie, you can think about this pre-pandemic, you can think about goals post-pandemic, uh, but you're coming home from dinner and a movie, your kids are home with a babysitter. Now think about what happens if something happens to you on the way home and a police officer shows up on your doorstep later that night, knowing something has happened to you or to you and your spouse and your kids are asleep upstairs in your home and your babysitter answers the door. Will your babysitter know what to do? Is there a plan for what happens under those circumstances? And what is that police officer gonna do next? This is the piece that when my kids were still young, when they were still daycare age, they were with a teenage babysitter on a fairly regular basis. My wife and I had a standing babysitter. It was actually a series of sisters within a local family that we worked our way through. <clears throat> Started with the oldest sister, worked our way down to the youngest sister. Primarily the middle sister was, was mostly our, our babysitter. Responsible kid, mom was the school nurse in town. <clears throat> but what my wife and I realized on a drive home one night from literally dinner and a movie was that if something happened to us, uh, our babysitter, as competent as she was, did not know about our plan. Didn't know we had a plan, didn't know how to implement that plan, didn't know that my sister and my brother-in-law in Connecticut were our long-term guardians. And in any event, the kids were too young at that point to be able to say, hey, I'm Kate, Uncle Bill, they're in Connecticut, pick up the phone, call them. And it would have taken my sister, my brother-in-law, two and a half hours of driving time to even get to our house. And what I realized is that in that time, a police officer was very likely, almost guaranteed actually, to call in the Department of Children and Families. And that my kids would have, be, would have been removed from our home, placed in the hands of strangers, even though my wife and I had a really good guardianship plan in place. We had primary guardians, we had backup guardians, and we had backups to the backups. So think about where the guardians you would want to be in place for your kids live. And think about what would happen if something happened to you, given how long it might take them to get to your kids. If it's more than 15 or 20 minutes, I know from talking to my police officer clients, and my state trooper clients, that they feel I have no other alternative but to call in the Department of Children and Families. Here's what I know as well, that they don't want to do this. And the Department of Children and Families does not want to get that call. So what I had to figure out when my kids were young was how to make sure that that never happened. And I did. And when I figured it out, I built it into my plan, and then I built it into the plan of all of our clients. And it's one of the primary reasons that we do webinars and presentations like we're doing tonight, because this little bit of information will be worth your spending uh, time here tonight. In the short term, here's how, what you wanna think about. You wanna think about people you know and trust who live close to where you live, and then give them the legal authority to step in and be with your kids on a short-term basis until your long-term guardian can arrive and take over. That's what I figured out for my kids. You can do it. I've done it. All of our clients have done it. You can do it too. You identify those people, you give them legal authority, 
And then you make sure that everybody who cares for your kids knows that that plan is in place and how to implement that plan. And we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in a bit. So that's the short-term piece. Back to where we started, which is really the long-term piece. The long-term piece, again, is the people who you want to take care of your kids until they are all 18 and legal adults. You wanna make sure that you've identified who you want. You wanna make sure you've identified who you don't want, if that applies. It may or may not, but it's an important piece if it does. You wanna make sure everything is appropriately documented. Here's what appropriately documented is not. Appropriately documented is not having a conversation with family members you want to play a role in this plan around the Thanksgiving family table or at a family get together. <clears throat> Appropriate documentation is not writing it on a piece of notebook paper as you're leaving the house to go fly without your kids for the first time. Appropriate documentation is not on a napkin. Lots of people think that if they write it down somewhere, it's legal. It's not. So you got to make sure that it's appropriately documented. And we'll talk more about that. <clears throat> so those two pieces, put them together. In our office, that's what we call our kids protection plan. And with that plan in place, with the short-term guardians in place, with those long-term guardians in place, you know that if anything ever happens to you or to you and your spouse, from the moment something happens to the survivor of you until your youngest child turns 18, there's people all along the way to care for them, love them, raise them, and guide them. And that is a good airtight plan for your kids, making sure you've got those guardians named for them in any of those times, okay? So now let's go to number two, a plan for your money or a plan for your assets. The first thing to know is that any asset that you own in your own name, and for most of you, that's gonna be your house, and it's gonna be your bank accounts, and it's gonna be your taxable investment accounts, your brokerage, mutual funds, things like that. The other two pieces are going to be your life insurance and your retirement accounts. But let's start with those first two pieces, your house, your bank, and your taxable investment accounts. If those assets are owned in your own names, either individually or jointly with your spouse, and something happens to both of you, those assets are automatically going to go through a probate court process. They're in your name or names. You've died. Now they've got to get into somebody else's name or names. And the question is, who? and how, and the probate court process is the how. If you don't have a plan, I'll give you the little bit of good news. The who is your kids. Even without a plan, the who's gonna be your kids if they survive you. But the how is gonna be uncomfortable and long and difficult. We'll come back to that uh, in just a second. So any assets you own in your own name going through probate, life insurance and retirement accounts, very often have beneficiary designations. So with a beneficiary designation, the asset goes directly to whoever you name as the beneficiary. If you die and your spouse is the beneficiary, that's going to happen. And that's fine if you die and your spouse is still living. But what happens if you and your spouse die and your kids are under the age of 18? Because when your kids are under the age of 18, they cannot receive the assets directly through inheritance. So even things that might pass directly without any court involvement can be pulled inadvertently back into a court process with court involvement because you've left uh, those to, to minor children by naming your kids as beneficiaries. What I see a lot is couples have named each other as primary beneficiaries, haven't named anyone as their secondary or contingent beneficiary, which means all those assets are going to get pulled back into the probate process. So, what is the probate process? It's the process, it's the core process which determines what assets you own, the value of those assets, and then the court helps to distribute those assets to your heirs at law if you don't have a plan. The process itself is, is time consuming. It takes at least a year to probate in the state in Massachusetts. It's never shorter. And that's because the Commonwealth will give your creditors a full year to make claims against your assets. So it's at least a year that your family is gonna be dealing with this court process. It is expensive. 
There are filing fees and accounting and appraisal fees and legal fees and executor and trustee and bonding fees and publishing fees. And it, at best it's thousands, very often it's tens of thousands of dollars that go out the back door to pay people you don't know to do things that are not important to you and will not make a material difference in your kids' lives. So it's, expen it's long, it's expensive, it's cumbersome. And by that, I mean your family won't have immediate access to your assets while they're going through probate. And if they need access for any reason, they need to get permission from the probate court. That can take weeks, that can sometimes take months, uh, depending upon where in the process things stand. Around things like real estate, <clears throat> probably take a full year to get permission to sell a house. Doesn't matter if the real estate market is red hot and buyers are lined up around the corner to buy your house, the probate court does not work quickly in a red hot market. It works at the same speed it does in a terrible real estate market. When your kids are still young, if there's no plan in place, the court is going to appoint someone to manage the assets for them until they turn 18. Going to be a stranger to your family, so your guardians are essentially going to be dealing with a stranger until your kids turn 18. And with no plan in place, your kids are going to be entitled to receive their share of the inheritance when they turn 18. The law does not care whether they, well, whether you think that's a good idea. The law does not care whether they are financially mature enough. As long as they are competent adults, they will be able to inherit everything at 18. Um, you can decide for yourselves whether or not you think that's a great idea. I'll tell you as the parent of a 21-year-old and a 24-year-old, probably not. Um, probably not. So just think about who you were and what you were doing when you were 18 and what you might have done with a half million dollars worth of life insurance proceeds. Um, last thing about probate is that it's public. Everything that gets filed with a probate court is a public document. Anybody can wander into the Middlesex probate court Monday through Friday, 30 in the morning till four in the afternoon. And they can sit down and they can read through anything that's been filed in your probate uh, file. Uh, they can pull out the documents, they can read through them, they can make copies of them, and they can walk out the door with the copies in their hands. And for better or for worse, there are people who spend time in probate court looking to see when an 18-year-old has just inherited a substantial amount of assets. So that's probate as a process. Um, if you don't like the sound of that process, I've got good news for you and that your family doesn't really have to deal with that process, but it requires setting up your plan the right way. It doesn't happen automatically. You've got to set, have a plan and you've got to set up the plan the right way. The way to set up a plan so as to avoid probate is to create, as part of your overall plan, what we refer to as a revocable living trust. You don't, you'd still have a will, but you would add to that a revocable living trust. And the trust would have all the instructions about what to do with the assets, how to manage it while your kids are still young, and ultimately how to distribute it to them when they become adults. And the idea is you create it while you're still alive. If you're married, you and your spouse can create it and probably would create it together. So it would be a joint trust. And you take your existing assets, your house, your bank accounts, your taxable investment accounts, and you transfer them into the name of the trust. So you essentially own your assets in the name of your trust while you're still living. Now, while you're still living, the assets are still yours. Your house is still your house. Your bank account is still your bank account. Your investment account is still fully available to you. You treat them exactly the way you do now. But the difference is when you die, those assets that are owned in the name of the trust at the time of your death do not have to go through probate. So that's the, a very simple, it's really the only foolproof way I know of getting your family out of probate is to create a revocable trust and transfer your assets into the trust while you're still living. The trust has two other benefits, fairly significant, uh, especially here in Massachusetts. Uh, number one, it can help you to save on estate taxes. And since estate taxes in Massachusetts kick in at just a million dollars, and by the way, your life insurance counts towards that million dollars. You just think about all the life insurance policies you have and add up the face values of those. And for a lot of you, it's gonna be over a million dollars right there, plus the equity value in your house, plus bank and investment accounts, plus your retirement accounts. Now you're talking about you know, fairly significant ass assets. Once you're at a million dollars, the estate tax of mass is almost $39,000. At a million and a half, it's $70,000. At 2 million, it's $106,000. 
and it keeps going up in marginal tax brackets in Massachusetts. And so the trust can be set up in a way so as to either eliminate or over a certain level, at least minimize those, the, the estate tax savings. So either to zero out the estate tax, instead of $100,000, you pay, your family pays zero, and that preserves $100,000 for your kids, for your family, something that could be invested over time to become more for them, instead of going to the Department of Revenue. So that's the second benefit of a trust. Third benefit of a trust is that when your kids become adults, some of you have got young adults or getting close to kids with, at, at young adulthood, the trust can be set up in such a way so that when your kids become adults, the money can be protected throughout their adult lifetimes so that it's available to them if they need it, they can manage it themselves. But if they ever have creditor issues or if they ever get sued, the money would be protected from outsiders or if they were ever to get married and then get divorced, the money could be protected so as not to be counted as a marital asset subject to division in a divorce. So that the money you're leaving to your kids is for your kids and can't be taken away from them by anyone else in their adult lives if they make mistakes as they are learning to become good, competent adults, as we all did. And quite frankly, we all are. So that's really a good plan for your money. Uh, about 95% of the clients that we work with in our office elect to, to go into a trust-based plan. They, we give them the options, 95% of them choose a trust-based plan because they know they don't want their family to get stuck in that probate process and they want things to be as easy and as seamless and as smooth for their families as possible, whether the kids are young, whether the kids are older. Uh, I find it's universally true. So that's the plan for money and assets. Next, let's talk about a plan for incapacity. Uh, this is really all about what happens if you're sick uh, or incapacitated and can't make decisions for yourself, can't make healthcare or legal or financial decisions. And again, with no plan in place, the most important thing for those of you who are married to know is that your spouse does not automatically get to step in and do these things for you. Um, around healthcare, it's a little bit easier because if your spouse is standing there and a decision needs to be made, the healthcare provider is probably going to be looking to your spouse to make that decision or to a close family member. But as to legal and financial decision making, if you have accounts in your own name and you're incapacitated, your spouse does not get to deal with those accounts. They do not get to make legal decisions for you. They don't get to sign legal documents on your behalf. They need court permission in order to do that. And if you don't have a plan, that court permission can take weeks, sometimes days, very often weeks, certainly in the pandemic, it's taken a lot longer than it has in the past. And sometimes decisions need to be made now. They can't wait for days or weeks uh, for the court to get its wheels turning. So the way to make sure that someone can step in and do things for you is to have a good incapacity plan. And here's what that looks like. There's three major documents and one ancillary document. The first of the major documents is on the healthcare side of things. It's called a healthcare proxy. And that is the legal document that allows someone to step in and make medical decisions for you if you can't make those decisions for yourself. It may be your spouse, it may be a child, it may be a sibling, it might be a parent, <clears throat> whoever it is. Um, it allows someone else to do those, to make medical decisions for you. With that, as important is a HIPAA waiver or a HIPAA authorization, because HIPAA, the federal medical privacy law, can get in the way of people making decisions for you because it prevents the disclosure of identifiable healthcare information about you to anyone else without your written consent. And so a HIPAA authorization is a way for you to consent in advance to the release of medical information to the people who are going to make decisions for you. So that's really, really important. Kind of an ancillary medical document is called a living will. And it is a roadmap essentially for your decision makers about how you want them to make decisions around life-sustaining treatment. If you're unconscious, if you're in a persistent vegetative state, there is no expectation that you'll recover a meaningful quality of life. This is the roadmap you give to others to make decisions uh, and how to make decisions about life-sustaining treatment. 
And then over on the legal and financial side, we've got another important document. It's called the Durable Power of Attorney. And it's the way for you to appoint someone to make legal decisions, to make financial decisions, to sign legal documents, to reallocate the investment mix in a 401k or an IRA, to do things like go to the post office and pick up your certified mail or manage your social media accounts, essentially to do all of the non-medical day-to-day things that you're used to doing for yourself. But if you were incapacitated, you wouldn't be able to do those things. And now a power of attorney would allow someone else to step right in and do those things for you without really skipping a beat. So that's the plan for incapacity. I think over the course of the last year and a half, that has become a really, really important piece. If you have adult children, you have a child 18 years of age or older, they need this incapacity plan. We do a lot of this work over the summer as kids head off to college uh, or school, and we do a lot of it on Thanksgiving breaks and especially over winter breaks as kids are coming home uh, from school uh, briefly. And that is to make sure that your adult children have someone who can make medical decisions for them and have a HIPAA authorization in place and a power of attorney. So if they go off to school and they get sick or if they get injured or they get in an accident, someone, it's probably you as the parent, but someone will be able to step in and manage things for them. Because for those of you who have an 18 year old, you know what you discovered when your child turned 18. All kinds of people who used to talk to you freely before your child was 18, suddenly no longer were willing or able to talk to you directly without your child's permission. It's just a function of them becoming a legal adult. So just keep in mind uh, that part of what we're always keeping our eye out for, for our clients is when their kids are turning 18 and making that recommendation to get what we call our 18 plus plan uh, in place for their adult children. All right, now I wanna go to the fourth element of a really good estate plan, and that's legacy planning. This is, as I said earlier, this is a little unusual. Uh, Most estate planning attorneys are not talking about this, let alone helping you to plan for this, but I think it's a really important piece. And ever since I discovered um, legacy planning, and I discovered it about 13, 14 years ago, um, I knew that it's something that we had to integrate into our estate planning for our clients. Um, And it's something that my wife and I have done ourselves. um, And it's probably one of the more most meaningful pieces of our overall estate plan. And legacy planning goes something like this. Um, There are things right now that are of value to you that you want to share with your kids, with your family, maybe even with the world at large, but they're inside of you. And and they don't show up in a traditional estate plan. It's not your bank accounts, it's not your money, it's not your house, it's not any of that. It's who you are and what's important to you and what are the values that you wanna pass on to your kids, to your family, to the world, Uh, what memories or stories or advice or guidance do you want to share with your kids or the people who are going to take care of your kids or manage the money for your kids until they're 18? All of those things that make you, you, that if you live to be 99, you would over the course of your long lifetime, share with your kids, with your grandchildren, with, you know, with the people who are close to you and, and, and mean a lot to you. But if something happens to you and that is unexpressed in some way, it's gone forever and it can't be recaptured. And so our legacy planning is designed to help you to capture that and record that in a meaningful way while you are still alive and healthy so that even after you're gone, your family has that part of you and it's not lost forever. And so it's in our office, this is our family wealth legacy interview. And it is a recorded, Uh, audio interview that we do with our clients after documents are signed, after the formal plans in place, it's recorded. Uh, We share the digital audio files with our clients and then they can store them in any way. Um, I don't even try to figure out how to store it digitally anymore. Uh, We started out with CDs when I was first doing this. 
And then we tried out thumb drives and now we just send the digital file in a, in a client uh, portal uh, so they can store it in any way they want. Who knows how we're gonna be playing digital files uh, 10, 15, 25 years from now. In any event, it's just an interview that we do with our clients that gets recorded and then you have that recording. Um, my wife, Paul, and I did ours about 11 or 12 years ago um, when the kids were still preteens and you know, it was when they still needed guardians. And it was the most meaningful at that time and still, it's the, one of the most meaningful 45 minutes I've ever spent in my life um, talking about our kids, what, what they meant to us, how much we loved them, what made us proud to be their parents, what we wanted my sister, my brother-in-law to know about raising them, about managing the money for them, what holidays were important to us, what vacations were important to us, what people were important, what friends of ours were important to us that we wanted to make sure our kids maintained a relationship with. Um, and again, I had the, the honor and the pleasure of sharing that experience with hundreds and hundreds of our clients. Um, and I've also had the experience of receiving wisdom from people in my own family um, in different ways, but from both of my grandmothers, from one of my grandmothers in a written form, which I wish was, had been recorded so that my kids could listen to it. I can read her story and I can still hear it in her voice but my kids don't have that benefit. But I also have an audio recording from my uh, paternal grandmother um, that my kids have been able to listen to. And um, so I just think that's a, a cool part of planning. And I think it's an important piece for people to think about because I don't think a lot of young parents especially think about this. I think people think about this when they get older, but I think when you've got young kids, I think that's even the most in many ways, the most important time to share what it is that you know you're going to share with them over time. But if you're not there, then that opportunity is, is really, as I said, lost forever. So that's the fourth part. So I wanted to talk about that as well. So let's talk about, let's just go back through this and, and kind of tie these pieces up. And then I wanna talk about next steps. So we talked about a plan for your kids, short-term guardians, making sure that there are people who live close to where you live who can step in and fill that gap that may exist between police officer shows up on your front doorstep and your long-term guardians arriving. It's making sure that's legally documented. It's making sure that your babysitter knows what to do so that they've got the right set of instructions. And we create all kinds of ancillary documents for our clients so that their babysitters, caregivers know exactly what to do. They know exactly who to call in an emergency. And that if our clients are ever in a car accident, people who are helping them will know exactly what to do and exactly who to call. And then long-term guardians, the people you know and trust to raise your kids until they are all adults. And again, documented appropriately. There's lots of documents that go into that. And again, notebook paper, not nearly enough. Um, then, a, then the plan for your money and your assets, it's gonna be at least a will. For those of you who want to avoid that probate court process, it's probably gonna be a revocable trust as well. And so making sure that is set up properly, that someone has walked you through thinking about all of the decisions that you need to make so that there aren't parts that are left out. I see too many trusts that leave all kinds of, that where no one has really thought things all the way through. And so there's big gaps in that. So you wanna make sure you're not only putting that together, but you're thinking about it the right way. And someone's helping you and guiding you to think about it the right way. The plan for incapacity, again, a little more straightforward, but we always wanna make sure that that's there and that all the component parts are there. So again, no gaps. That's always a big part of planning, no gaps. As I say to my clients, I never want anybody in your family to look around at any future point in time and say, uh-oh, what do we do now? <clears throat> That's the idea of a rock solid plan is making sure that there are no gaps and that there's redundancy built in. So no one ever says, uh-oh, what do we do now? 
And then finally, that plan for incapacity, uh, I'm sorry, that plan for legacy, the legacy plan to make sure that those intangible pieces of you uh, are captured in the overall plan so that they're not lost forever. Okay, so now that we've been through that, I want you to ask yourself a really, really important question. I'm gonna answer your questions in just a minute, but now I want you to think about a really, and ask yourself a really important question. Given everything that we've talked about, given everything that you've been thinking about around the last 45 minutes or so, here's the question. Do you want to leave things the way they are, the way they are right now for your family? Do you want to leave things the way they are right now for your family? And the answer is either yes or no. I'm either willing to let it ride or I must do something different. I must create a better plan for my family. If the answer is I got to do something different, then the next question is, what are you going to do about it? Are you simply going to say to yourself, I need to do something about that? And then let life interfere later tonight, tomorrow, all through the weekend, next week, for you, it's Halloween this weekend, got to get ready for Halloween. Before you know it, holidays are right around the corner. Next thing you know, it's the end of January and you're thinking back on your New Year's resolutions. You're like, oh boy, I didn't get that done. Your urgency is gone. The momentum you had even getting onto this webinar tonight is gone. So the question is, what are you going to do about that? For some of you, let me give you a pathway. If you don't exactly know, I want to do something about that, but I'm not exactly sure what to do next, David. Here's an idea. Let us help you get this started. Let us help you get a plan in place. Let us walk you through all of the things you need to think about, through all of the decisions you need to make, and let us guide you toward creating a rock-solid plan for your family so that you can rest easy at night knowing that if anything ever happens to you, and it probably won't, but if anything ever does, eventually it will, but it probably won't in the short term, but if it does, you'll know that your family will be cared for by the people you want, in the way you want, no matter what, okay? Now, the way that we do that is through our family wealth planning session. And what I'd like to offer to you in exchange for spending time with me tonight is the opportunity to get on our calendar for your own family wealth planning session. Family wealth planning session is a two hour long meeting broken into two parts. The first hour is an in-depth, deeper dive into what we've been talking about for the last 45 minutes. If you're married, it would be you and your spouse together at this meeting with me or one of the other attorneys in our office. And the first hour is helping you understand here's where you are right now, helping you to get clear about what's gonna happen where you are right now, and also helping you to get clear about where you wanna be instead if where you are is not where you wanna stay. Where are you now? Where do you want to be? And our job is to help you get from point A to point B, to show you how we can guide you from where you are to where you want to be. And then the second hour is, is reserved if you decide, okay, I don't like where I am. You've helped me figure out where I want to go instead. I understand how you can help me go from where I am to where I want to go. Now I just want to go. And so that second hour then is you deciding, yeah, I want to get my plan together. It seems like we're a good fit for each other. I've looked through the planning levels. I understand uh, the cost of all of this and I, want to, and I want to move forward. And then we can use the second hour to start designing that plan for you, for us to help you make the decisions you need to make to get that plan in place. And then it's just a short leap to getting the plan signed, and you being able to sleep easy at night knowing that plan is in place. So I'd like to offer you all the opportunity to get a family wealth planning session in our office. Now, in order to do that, to first figure out whether or not we're gonna be a good fit for each other, uh, what you wanna do is schedule a quicker call, about a 15 minute call with our client services coordinator. Um, her name is Lori. 
And we're going to drop a link to Lori's scheduling calendar right in the chat. So you can just click on that link. You'll go into Lori's calendar and you can find a time to chat with Lori. Lori will get to know a little bit about you and your family. We'll share a little bit about us, about how we work, about what you could expect in a little more detail in the family wealth planning session. And if it makes sense to schedule a two hour meeting with us, then Lori will be able to help you to do that. But Lori is your first step in getting that done. Um, and so go ahead and click on that link and hop on to Lori's scheduling calendar. And if you think you need to get this done, then I encourage you just make the investment of 15 minutes. You'll really like talking with Lori. She's, a, she's very fun to talk to. Um, she's been with us a long time and everybody loves her. And um, so there's that opportunity. Um, if you want some more information beyond tonight, um, we'll drop in the chat a link to download either of our guides. There is a kids protection planning guide if you have minor children, and there is an empty nester guide if you have adult children, and if you have kids that are straddling both some that are still minors, some that are over age 18, maybe you just wanna download both guides. Um, but either way, we'll drop links into the chat so you can uh, so you can download those guides uh, directly from us. Um, but now I want to scroll back up and take a look at what questions have uh, come through. So let me get back to the top. Da, 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 da. All right. So um, I think it looks like the first question is, do you accept uh, the ERIC legal plan? Um, we don't. But here's the thing, I used to. I used to accept ERIC. ERIC is a legal plan that's offered by a lot of big companies. Um, Hyatt is another legal plan offered by companies. And it's basically like having legal insurance through your employer. Um, here's the downside of an ERIC plan. It is super bare bones. And the problem with an ERIG plan, and ultimately, by the way, the reason I left their panel um, was that the, the plan does not cover nearly enough for parents with young kids. So the short answer is no, we don't take ERIG, but I think it's important to say why I don't take ERIG. And it's because I don't think it's an adequate plan for parents with young kids. And too many people felt I think because it was a benefit of their employment that they would just take that and you know it wasn't costing them anything. And so I decided at some point I really could not look in the mirror and say I really truly served and cared about families if I continued to take Eric. And ultimately that's why I left. I think it serves a purpose. I think it does not do very well with respect to estate planning. Um, uh, question, how are international estates uh, assets handled? How are international assets handled? Can they be added to the trust? The answer is in, short, in short is no, uh, they can't. Um, and the reason is because the trust that we create here is a US trust um, and adding foreign assets to a US trust. Uh, number one, in many, in many foreign jurisdictions, the concept of a trust doesn't exist. There's not many places. The United States is the primary place where trusts are even a thing. In the UK, a little bit too, and a couple of other countries. But for most of the world, trusts are not a recognized legal concept. And so the, the ability to even put assets into a trust may not exist uh, for, for most international assets. The second drawback is that foreign assets in a US-based trust run the risk of the trust being considered a foreign trust and subjecting it to foreign taxes uh, that may be unknown as opposed to just known US-based taxes. Um, so, the answer, so the answer is no, we don't put international assets. They're handled in different ways. Sometimes you need a will in the country where the asset is located to deal with making sure the asset gets transitioned to who you want it to go to. Um, I've got lots of uh, clients from Scandinavian countries. I have lots of Swedish clients 
who all have Swedish wills, in addition to their US-based plan. Uh, I've got some clients from France who have French wills um, and from other jurisdictions, but generally you need a separate plan for uh, foreign assets. Let's see, any other questions in there? Looks like that's it. Usually uh, what I get from fewer questions is that I did a better job explaining everything at the front end. So um, if there are no other questions, uh, I want to thank you for joining me tonight. Again, if you want to take advantage of scheduling a call with Lori, the link is there, of emptying the K uh, downloading the KPP guide, the Kids Protection Planning Guide, or the Empty Nester Guide, Emptying the Nest. Uh, you can click on those links there. We'll leave the room open for uh, a few minutes so that you can go back in and click those links. I don't want to take them away from you. Uh, if you haven't gotten to that yet. So we'll leave the room open. But otherwise, I want to thank you very much for joining me tonight. Uh, I like doing this. I like sharing this information with you. It's really one of the reasons that I get out of the bed. Uh, I get out of bed every morning and go into the office. And I know everybody on our team um, feels uh, substantially uh, the same way. So thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. And I hope to have the opportunity to see and talk to you uh, soon. So thanks for joining us tonight. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you.